Everybody, welcome to Custody Matters. My name is Danica Joan. I am here. My my co-host is Wendy Perry, and today's special guest is Ginger G Gentile, and she is the director of a documentary called uh, "What Is It?" Erasing Families, uh, and it's supposed it's due to come out and be released in the fall. Oh, that's right. <laughs> That's it. Go. Erasing family. And um, this is something, this is going to be coming out in the fall. I'm super excited about it. I know Wendy happens to be in the documentary. So I'm going to probably let Wendy, you and I Ginger. I, I didn't, uh, you're not actually. Oh, I'm not? Oh. Okay. Yeah. That was a surprise to me either way. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm just completely I, misinformed. Maybe I got cut. Maybe I was in it and I got cut. Okay. <laughs> I filmed an event in D.C., but I don't think, I mean, I mean, I can get into why, but basically because I couldn't have any of the protagonists at the event, it, it, it was just, uh, that's okay. just there if, if anybody wants it. I, I'm happy to give them that footage. Well, see, I'm anyway. com I am completely misinformed. All right, so I'm going to step back and let Wendy <laughs> talk to Ginger, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be on a fly on the wall. Take it away. Well, um, I didn't think I was in it, so, um, okay. yeah, I didn't hear that rumor, but, um, Ginger, <laughs> how are you? You're I'm very, doing, very busy, aren't you? I'm doing really good. Uh, I wanted to share some exciting news after uh, we, we talked a little about what the documentary is for people who maybe haven't heard of a racing family. Yeah, um, if you would, kind of start at the beginning of what motivated you or inspired you to do this documentary. And for those who don't know, um, probably tell them that there was another documentary before this one. So can you right. kind of start at the beginning, give a little background on this? Sure. Uh, so I made my first documentary on this subject. It's called Erasing Dad, and you can actually watch it for free at erasingfilling.org, and that documentary we filmed in Argentina, and the reason why, why I asked why Argentina, I was living there for 13 years, because that was the furthest I could get away from my crazy family, in New York, and I was living there, uh, working in the film industry, and I met a man who told me that he hadn't been able to see his daughter uh, at that point for six years, and like a lot of people, when I heard that, I said, well, you must have a really bad lawyer. I'll go down to the courthouse with you, look at your documents. I'm sure we'll get this figured out in a few days. And then I realized that he had a really great lawyer who's working pro bono on his case. And also, uh, there were tons of orders saying that he could see his daughter, and they weren't being enforced. Uh, and I'm sure the viewers who are listening will and watching are familiar with this. Uh, the mother would never take the kid to the appointed visits. So then what became a regular visitation schedule, he eventually began asking, begging for maybe just on Father's Day, on um, his birthday to be able to see his child. And this was never enforced. This went on for many years. Uh, long story short, with that case, they spent, uh, they were unable to have any contact between the eight when she was six, and they finally reunited when she was 21 years old. And that was zero contact. Uh, wow. So, no emails, no Facebook yeah. messages. She was removed from social media, so you couldn't even like you know look at photos online. And uh, but the good news is that hope is possible, even in these horrible cases where there's no contact and the, and the judicial system is absolutely worthless. And so his story inspired me to create a film uh, about all the other fathers I met in Argentina who were unable to see their kids. And the reason why I say fathers is because before Racing Dad came out, uh, the law in Argentina said custody automatically goes to the mother. Uh, so every once in a while, I wouldn't meet a mother who could see their children, but normally it was because they were married to a governor or a very wealthy man who had a lot of power. So the law was very clear. And after the film came out in 2014, the first thing it did was it took, it, it gave people a way to talk about a problem in a new way and to feel like they weren't alone. So at the very least, they could take this movie and show their friends and family, hey, I'm not alone, this is what's happening to me. So people felt more emboldened, they began to feel less shame talking about being a raised parent. And the interesting side of it is that the film actually was censored. And it was, it was I think the only film 
in the past 20 years or so that's been censored in Argentina, and that was by a judicial order. And the reason why is that family court likes to remain in secret, and we interviewed people who work in family court, and they did not like how the film made them look, because we record them on camera saying they don't care what the dad did, they will do whatever it takes to remove a father from the kid's life, because the most dangerous place for a child is their own home, because of the presence of the father, because all men are just rapists in potential, just waiting for a moment to rape their own children. As ridiculous as that sounds, that base, that's basically what they say in the film. And um, they got a judge to go along with this, but the good news, and also why this is a very stupid tactic on their part, is that everybody wants to see a censored film. So the film became front page news in Argentina. Everybody was talking about it, even though it was very hard to see. And um, that's why if you go watch on YouTube, you'll see there's very few views, and that's because YouTube took it down seven times. Mm -hmm. But all of that, you know, commotion amongst the film, we did so much press on this and conferences, that people had a new skill set about how to talk about this. And long story short, the, um, the legislature in Argentina passed uh, a resolution taking out of all the gender preference and custody matters and allowing for joint custody. Before the film, you couldn't even get joint custody. It didn't exist legally in Argentina, except interestingly, interestingly enough, if you were a same-sex couple, because then there was no way to do gender discrimination in same-sex couples in Argentina, legalized same-sex marriage in 2011. Fast forward a little bit, I came back to the United States and I wanted to do a follow-up film, and I just put up a Facebook page called Erasing Family, and I begin to just get all these messages of people who can't see their kids. And the first thing that surprised me were just the sheer number of mothers who couldn't see their kids. And to me, that's just evidence that the business of family court doesn't care about who they're erasing as long as there's money to be made and there's money made by prolonging the conflict. And then the other thing I began to see were kids, uh, sometimes as young as seven, um, a lot of their teens making videos on YouTube and Facebook um, these kids have probably now moved on to Instagram, they're no longer on Facebook, uh, about how they were upset with not being able to see a parent or a sibling, how they were angry at the judges in their case. And that's when I had the idea I had to make a new film that would be from the children's point of view. So I then spent the next few years actually finding children who would be willing to speak on camera. Um, so it was very difficult because I'm sure I could pick any city in the world and have more than enough parents to interview. But finding kids who are good on camera, who want to tell their stories and have a good story, it's exceedingly difficult. And it also meant that we had a film raising family in over 12 locations in the US and Canada because we had to go to where the kids were. So it's a very international film. We're finishing up the post production right now. And um, some exciting news about what's going to happen is uh, next week we're going to announce the launching of our impact campaign and we're going to be creating resources for kids. So after they watch the film, they'll be able to process what they're seeing and have peer to peer support to reach out to their erased parent if they want, or at least not feel alone, kind of like similar to the suicide crisis text line. And in part that's because, you know, there aren't really any resources for young adults. There's a ton of books uh, and videos for young children, but you can't give a 20 year old a book that's written for an eight year old. And you can't give a 15 year old a book written for a 10 year old. It has to be age appropriate to where they're at. And the other thing is that we are uh, just today, literally today, um, I don't want to say which states, but two state legislatures uh, reached out to see if they could screen a racing family one in mid-June and one in uh, in September of next year. We're working on a screening in the U.S. Senate, which we're very exciting about, excited about. And also, um, and we just sent out this email today. So we'll be at the Americans for Equal Shared Parenting uh, Summit in Washington, D.C. on June 28th. And we'll be showing a sneak peek of the film. So it's not the film in its entirety, but um, anyone who's going to the summit for a small additional fee, or if you're not going and just want to see the film, you can buy a ticket. And we'll be talking about how you can use a 30 minute cut of the film to change, um, to help change policy regarding shared parenting and family court reform. And it's very important for us when we launch this film 
that this film is a tool that can be used by all the advocates working in this space. And we're really relying on our network of followers and volunteers to take this film out to their communities and to use it to support the work that they're doing because we know that the solutions in each community will be quite different. So what may be a big priority in one community might not be in another. So the film is a tool because if the film covers um, in no particular order uh, what it's like when a, when a child is brainwashed or taught to, to hate the other parent, which is sometimes referred to as parental alienation. It refers to how the child support system is used to create a perverse incentive to fight for more parenting time and also how all these resources are sent to the state instead of the families because what I thought and for a lot of people thought is that when you pay child support it goes to the child or if you want to be cynical it goes to your bitter ex who uses it to paint her nails um, but what we found is a lot of that child support doesn't go to either of those it goes to the state um, and people can be paying thousands of dollars for decades and it doesn't go to any family member, it goes to fill potholes or whatever. Um, and it also then deals with how by having a complicated expensive divorce system, we are traumatizing children and one of the solutions is um, court reform that makes divorce more simple by providing more resources to families, so in court meditation. Um, I'm sorry, in courthouse meditation, so people have an alternative to an adversarial trial. And also what we're very excited about is by saying that, you know, presuming that shared parenting uh, is the norm and that there's a presumption of shared parenting if both parents are fit can really help decrease conflict because it's all about when there's a family that's in conflict, how can we help them move forward and how can we make divorce healthier for all children? Wow. Wow, I know, exactly. <laughs> well, one thing, uh, there's a lot of things that you mentioned that I would I'd love to touch on, but one thing that you talked about that I'm so excited to hear, and I want to learn more about this, is that you said uh, you're going to soon launch resources for kids. And um, a few years ago, I was approached by a high school. Mm -hmm. And the student newspaper wanted to interview me because the students wanted to know skills that they could use to help themselves. Um, because as you know, kids are open to talking about this, but usually it's, it's the adults that don't want to talk about it. Right. Um, and, but the kids know it's happening. It's happening to them or it's happening to their friends. And the students at this high school said, well, what? do I do when my mom says this to me? Or what do I do when my dad does that? Give us some skills, what can we do? And so I um, wrote an article for this high school um, for the students with skills they can use, things they can say and do when they're in that situation. So what kind of resources um, are you going to be launching for kids and, and how can they connect with you on that? I think that is, it's just valuable, it's so important that we get that information out for, to these kids. It is, and, and part of it is I know that there are so many support groups for adults, um, but what we're gonna do is, is create peer-to-peer -peer resources. So I'm in touch with uh, kids, and when I say kids, I, I just wanna clarify, I, I mean children in the family relationship structure, so a lot of them are over the age of 18. Uh, yes. so, so I always like to clarify that, that, that a kid can be 30 in this, in this context. Uh, what I want to the first step is actually getting these kids together and some of them are reunited erased kids some are were never really erased but they can't they don't have contact with the sibling or have gone through other uh, high conflict divorces and asking them what ways and kind of creating a brain trust so I can ask them and we can work together to create resources in a way that is appropriate for them so I don't really have like the exact answer, but what we've been playing with is like a text line, um, so people can get some text. You know, because kids also they don't like to talk on the phone these days. So kind of like with, similar to a suicide crisis hotline, creating very simple to understand videos that would complement the film, um, tips on what to do, but also and also just the social media presence, but that's really child directed. Uh, because I have seen groups that have started on Facebook that are like four kids and they usually get filled up with parents. So this is like 
really just thinking about like what are some ways that we can reach out to young people inform them in a, in a very basic way but also you know if someone's 25 they might not be able to afford therapy or coaching so what are some basic tips and sometimes it's just giving them permission like you can have a relationship with both parents and these are some ways to navigate it um these are some ways to feel safe or if you can't locate a parent this is possibly how you can get in touch with that parent some ways you know to do some research so it's still very much in its infancy, but the actual idea for this came because uh, one of our ambassadors, we have a program where anyone can sign up on our webpage and get trained to be an ambassador to bring the film into their community. So they learn how to set up screenings, how to talk about this issue without talking about their story. And one person took this to a high school and they said, and this to me is kind of you know, wacky that this is what they said. They said, okay, we don't want to show the film, because let's say we show the film and there's kids who identify with this. We have no idea what to do or what to help them. And there's no resources for them. So we're just going to make a bad situation worse because now they're going to go from being abused to knowing that they're being abused and knowing that nobody can help them. So it's better that we don't talk about this at all. Um, mm. Maybe that was an excuse they had, but you know, I was like, well, let's take them at their, world, at their word and start developing resources. Um, I'm just also in touch with people from other parts of the world who are developing graphic novels and seeing what we can use for an English speaking audience. So it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, finding this, this space for young adults, because when I go to these conferences, there's tons of books for little kids. Yeah. So when you ask, what do you have for a 16 year old? They're like, Oh, we don't have anything. And but you're also like, well, I you can't give a 16 year old a, a book for an eight year old. Yeah. So I think it will be a long ongoing process, but the first is at least something that we can use to triage. So like just some basic skills. Um, also, you know, um, that kids can take this to their schools or their universities and, and start replicating. But I really want to listen to what they think would be helpful to them and not dictate because um, what I think would be helpful. So it's kind of like the, the film you know, when I, when I made a racing family, my whole question, the question I had always asked myself when I was choosing what to put in it is, okay, if I'm a 20 year old and I haven't spoken to my mom in five years, what would convince me to sit down and have some coffee or tea with her? Mm. What information would be helpful to understanding the system, but also uh, to understanding, you know, what are the family dynamics that are involved? So the film itself, it does go into family dynamics, but in a very blame-free way. Um, it doesn't, you, you know, it's and any blame that is to be had is on a system that's ineffective at dealing with this. It's not about a good parent or a bad parent. And in fact, what the film says is the big problem is trying to assign blame. So whenever you have like a custody evaluation that tries to figure out who's the better parent or asking a kid which parent they want to live with, that blame game is what uh, fuels this unhealthy dynamic as opposed to um, diffusing an unhealthy situation. Because, you know, to be clear, when people are going through divorce, they're upset, they're angry, they're, they're heartbroken, it's a crisis. But how can we get people out of that crisis towards something healthier as opposed to trying to figure out, well, who started the crisis in the first place, which really isn't helpful. So that's a big right. answer, but but we're like <laughs> I'm literally like finding the first kids right now who are willing to um, to do this, and also knowing that you know they're all incredibly busy. So what can we get out? You know, what kind of leadership can we get out of them with a few hours a month? But we'll be like launching like this next week, and I'm hoping that when the film premieres in the fall, those resources will be in place, and maybe they'll grow. Um, and also, I want to inspire other advocates to include kids more in their work. Uh, for example, you know, I was talking with a conference um, that's happening in for shared parenting in the late summer, and I asked them, "Well, are you meeting any kids?" And they said, "Well, we hadn't, we didn't even think about that." And I'm like, "You're not even gonna have like at this huge conference like one or two young adults who can speak about what they went through." So I think just including that perspective of these young adults and some of them are like in their 30s so we're not talking about like bringing 12 year olds into like this, this conference setting who can talk about their trauma and i think people are more apt to listen to the kids uh than the parents in these situations 
you know, I'm so, I'm so glad you pointed that out. And I think it's always important, important to educate people about that. Um, when we say alienated kids, what we're talking about is children of parental alienation and they can be any age. They can be in their twenties, thirties, forties. Um, I got a message from someone the other day who is still, they're in their fifties yeah. and they're still dealing with this and trying to figure out how to have a relationship with both of their parents. So yeah. um, it can, it can be any age and it affects, uh, these children of parental alienation into adulthood. And I think that this is the thing, I know with, you know, with uh, child sexual abuse, that a lot of times it isn't until they're around the age of 27 that they're able to actually fully uh, deal with what they've been put through as a child. And, um, you know, so whether it's sexual abuse or it's, or it's parental alienation, which is a form of abuse, it sometimes, I have to go through that hurdle of uh, betraying the, the the parent they were aligned with and uh, and speaking out and I I think it's great that you're targeting you're really trying to get these twenty somethings these these adult children of parental alienation uh, in that conversation because really they're the ones we can somehow reach out to them and get them the, the you know change the the direction of of where they're going it can impact their families that they're creating well because also the, a lot of times when kids have aged out of the system or even in some states as soon as they get to be 13 and 14 and they can say which parent they want to see and which parent they never want to see ever again the courts kind of stop i don't think they're effective at all um but they really stop being effective with older children um so <laughs> This was kind of inspired, especially like by some people who I knew who their kids are over 18 or they've been in family court for 10 years and they've kind of seen the writing on the wall that the courts are not going to be able to help them. So what are ways to reunite when you can't use the courts? Also, I think the, the other thing that has been very enriching and eye-opening for me interviewing children for the film is that, you know, when you talk to adults who are affected by this, it's, it can be very black or white, and the kids see a lot more gray. And for them, the big issue is the conflict itself and these loyalties that are being torn. And, you know, one, one interview I remember in the film is a young man decides to never speak to his mother again. He eventually gets adopted by his stepmom. And when I was interviewing him, I said, well, what did they say about your, your mom? Like, what was, you know... What were the accusations? Was, oh, no, no one ever accused her of anything. Went to the mom. What did they accuse you of? Kind of being unstable, but it was like it was it was saying that it wasn't like there was a psych evaluation or anything. Interviewed the stepmom. No, no, we never said anything about her. So I asked the young man, "Well, why did you make this drastic choice?" He goes, "It was just so stressful to see her. It was just easier not to see her." Mm. So what? So. So I think that you know it's it's by it's by treating the entire system and diffusing the conflict, um, because I have noticed that some kids, um, especially the ones who you know, as Ryan Thomas says, are uh, like the hostage kids, and they're the ones who tend to plus minus two weeks from turning eighteen, kind of flip loyalties and find their parent that they couldn't see. Um, I've even had cases of kids who never saw their dad, like they literally never met their dad. And at the age of 18, within two weeks, they're living with their dad, who they never met. Um, mm -hmm. But for other kids, if you start to say, oh, one parent abused you, manipulated you, they're very turned off because what they really want is to have a relationship with everybody. So it's, and then also, you know, if you talk about, you know, just reducing conflict in general, then you also can, are able to help a lot of uh, children and families who have a high conflict divorce, but it might not particularly be parental alienation or erasing or any, or, or it, maybe it's, it's kind of going there, but not really. Um, because right now the system just creates conflict. So by reducing this conflict and teaching these skills, we're making divorce and separation healthier for all families. Um, which is something I also see in general when people talk about this issue, they tend, because the ones who are really interested in this, they tend to have the worst cases as opposed to saying, well, how can we make this healthier for everybody going through this? Because even if, let's say, you know, your divorce costs $200,000, which is above average, 
if the average is still thirty thousand dollars that's still way too high mm -hmm. uh, so it's like how can we reduce these costs these conflicts for everybody and i think kids really want to get on board with that because it's like for for some kids you know even you mentioned the word parental alienation and they get really turned off i remember like one one kid was like I don't want to speak at that conference because it's a parental alienation conference, but I'd speak at any other conference. You no, know, so like I'd speak at the same conference if they just changed their name. Oh wow. Because it, it's just because for them, if they have a relationship with both parents, they can never admit that one parent alienated them. Yeah, I think yeah. that I think that um, ties into what you were talking about that the kids they don't want there to be blame on either parent. Mm -hmm. Most of the kids. There's some kids right. who really are angry at one parent. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there are kids who have told me I had to look at the entire divorce file to figure it out. And then there are kids who say, I don't want to hear anything about what happened. I'm just here with you now. And they really don't want to hear about it. So I, I think, you know, there, there's definitely two different types and you, and you probably never know. So, you know, I always tell parents, you know, like save everything, um, but you know, don't even offer it unless asked. And if they want to see it, they'll ask you probably pretty soon. That you know, I want to see the divorce files, um, or they might ask you for it five years later if they want to start figuring stuff out. Um, but not. But I think because this the most heartbreaking thing that I hear from some parents is saying, "I'm going to court. I know I'm not going to win, but one day I want to give the kid the file to show." How much I fought for them, and I was thinking, what if they say they don't want to see it? Mm. Then you said, are you finding years in aggravation to produce papers that they don't want to see? I know you said that um, yeah. there are legislators that are interested in the documentary mm -hmm. and uh, conferences, and um, probably mental health professionals. I'm guessing, mm -hmm. but what about judges? Are you getting an interest from any family court judges about seeing? Oh, the doing a screening for about a, over 100 judges uh, in about two weeks. Wow. That's awesome. awesome. So, um, well, you know, I feel like it's, it's very interesting because there's a lot of documentaries about a lot of different topics that tend to be, you know, very uh, controversial. But this one, it's people are so nervous about this topic. Uh, and I find it very interesting because it's such a common thing. But there's so much nervousness or people, you know, oh, I'm not sure if I want to show because what if it offends somebody? I'm like, mm. well, I also can't make a film saying that everything's fine. Because that would not only be untrue, but also very boring that nobody would watch. But, you know, people are very nervous. You know, I, I remember someone says, oh, could you redo the brochure? Because it says reuniting families are raised by family court. And we don't want to offend anybody. I'm like, I don't care if you change the brochure, but like, it's kind of the point of the film. At some point, they're going to see what the film is about and it's and it's done in a way where you know it's very much the system and we don't call out particular judges and also in the film we interview two judges who have completely changed the way they operate you know family court in one case um they actually reunite a family this particular judge and another they uh, this judge has decided that asking kids who they want to live with is completely worthless and it's, it's not only stressful for the child but you don't get any accurate testimony from it. So the idea is to reduce the conflict as opposed to asking the child, who do you want to live with? So those are the judges that are kind of highlighted in the film. But you know, don't say family court is great, it's wonderful, and everything's hunky dory. we just want to make it a little better. It, it does show that the, there is a, a big issue with the system. Um, and you could say it's a cost issue because it's too expensive. And right now most people are pro se, which means they represent themselves in family court. Um, you could say that it's just, you know, it's, it's creates childhood trauma unnecessarily. Um, and, you know, one of the big questions the film asks is that there's all this money in child support enforcement. And what if that money was spent either as, you know, I don't go as far and say it, but, you know, just direct payments to the families as opposed mm -hmm. to incarcerating people or providing programs to help people get on their feet and to help families, you know, heal. Uh, because I think the big tragedy is that there isn't really any free mental health services, free mediation, with some exceptions out there for people who are going through this. And that's a huge issue is, is access. Um, this is a new way, it's another way to talk about it, is access to the justice system. And right now there's a big movement to reducing fines because they are mainly um, negative for poor people. 
uh, bail, again, it attacks poor people, uh, looking at who gets, you know, attorneys provided by, to them by the state, because otherwise only rich people have access to justice. And we need to ask these same questions in a similar way about family court, which is why do only people with money and some families that might be one of the two parents have access to lawyers and expert witnesses, and some people don't have access to anything. And that's a very unfair system. And I think it's by making things more fair and also by, you know, as one judge in the film says, you know, rethinking the entire system is just way too complicated. I know in California there are 200 forms that are used in family court. And like, how can any lawyer, let alone pro se litigant, handle that, that sort of paperwork? It's, it, it is, wow. I mean, I think a lot of it is, um, is, they don't have the answers. I mean, the judges are, don't have the answers. A lot of times these mental health counselors come in completely ignorant about what to look for. And, and they're, they're held up as these experts that have this degree. So therefore they should know what to do. And yet they're making bad calls. Um, you know, the other thing I've always um, said about is that, so dependency court with the foster system is all about reuniting parent and child, even if the parent has been found guilty of abuse or neglect, it's the, the court does everything they can to rehabilitate that family so that they can reunite the child with the parent. And yet in family court, it is the objective of uh, lawyers to, to cut out a, a child, a parent from a child, uh, child's life. And it just seems so, um, awful. I know as a family mediator, I love working with pro se because I know that, they, that I can create some workability with them. But when you get a judge, a, an attorney in there, they, they cast the shadow of, of, of um, suspicion on the other, uh, the other party. And next thing you know, you, the, the one that they're representing is like, they're not making any deals in mediation. No, it's, I think, it's and I think a lot of the frustration, I, I was sorry, Ginger, I was going to say, I think a lot of the frustration is, um, Danica, you mentioned that they cast, oops, that they cast suspicions on one of the parents. And I think one of the frustrating things for families is that, like the one mom that you were talking about, she wasn't accused of any abuse. There wasn't any evidence of any abuse or of any wrongdoing sounds like they just implied that she was kind of wacky um, but that somehow ended up being fuel for the fire in court and I think that's a lot of the frustration for these families is that um, you don't necessarily even have to have any proof of any kind of abuse right. or any wrongdoing um, but the case could go on forever and ever and ever and ever and really tear the family apart Oh, yeah, yeah that, that's that definitely um, something that happens is, yeah, it, it can be these subtle accusations that aren't really accusations that are made in a formal way, um, or it could just be getting the child to take the stand and say, I don't want to see you anymore. And then there's no accusation, I just don't want to. And um, and so there's those are certain things that, you know, just kind of, they should be signs that there's something that is that there, it's a family that needs help, as opposed to one parent needs to be blamed and get nothing. One parent gets everything. Okay, so Ginger, we um, it's time to wrap up, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to tell people how they can reach out to you, what it is that sure. you um, they could be of contribution to your organization. Right. Um, so right now, um, if people want to get involved and host a screening, they can go to our website, erasingfamily.org, uh, and they can fill out a host a screening form. They can also sign up to volunteer or be an ambassador, which means you'll be trained on how to set up screenings. So if you don't have a venue in mind or a venue that you know will screen it, you can do that. Um, what, what we're also looking for are sponsors because there's a lot of uh, conferences, organizations, venues, like the state legislatures, like state legislatures by law, they cannot spend money to bring the film there. So we are looking for people who will sponsor or donate for these specific screenings. So we can take it all over the country and Canada and like not, and, and 
it's not relying on each group to, to pay for the screening. So that's something that we're very interested in. So if there's any people out there who have a business, whether it's in the space or a different business and are interested in sponsoring a screening, um, like people are like, oh, I'm in, you know, New Jersey or Michigan, and I really want this in my state legislature, contact us because we have the people and the volunteers, but sometimes it just lacks a little resource in that way. Um, also, if anybody, I haven't put the link up there yet because we haven't announced it, but if anybody knows of young people, kids who want to participate in like our youth um, action committee, I'm thinking about our name, um, they can contact this with us as well, but and generally we're asking just for a few hours a month of commitment at the minimum. And it's kind of more of a sounding board, and then you know we will then take that information and create these youth resources. Do so, they have to be 18, Ginger? Do they have to be 18 or can they be under 18? They can be under 18. I think it'd probably be better if they're at least over 16. Um, just because I think well, what I would say is that they're really young, if I, and if I can talk to them with at least one parent's permission, I would just probably just talk to them and get and just like to see what their opinions are on certain things. Um, but they should probably be at least 16. Um, I just think because at that age you can start to be like responsible about about stuff. Um, so I don't want to limit it. But also, this is important. These are not people who will be interviewed or in the film. So you can be completely anonymous. It's more for like, well, you know. What type of memes and posting will work on Instagram to relate to you? What type of materials mean to you? Is this too wordy? Uh, what advice would you give somebody in your situation? What advice was was helpful to you? And also then taking the kids who are talking about this publicly and just coordinating our efforts so like stuff gets released on platforms that can get them more views um, and more traction. So it, it's so. Someone can say, I don't want my name to ever be out there in my face. That's totally fine. It's not being interviewed for a film or a video. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, taking time out. I, I know we're going to cross paths uh, in the near future. And um, I love the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing the work and, and talking about this important subject each week. All right. Hey, uh, Ginger, this is Dave Slaughter. I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Hey, it was, it was good meeting you in New York City, by the way, with Michelle and myself meeting you. Um, if I wanted to do one of these uh, screenings here in Georgia, in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and, and I have, uh, if I have the financial whereabouts to help support that, I don't actually have any of the logistical knowledge as far as organizing such an event. Uh, with the state legislator or anything like that. Is, is that something you could actually, your, your team could actually help out with? Yeah, so if you're interested in a particular state, like I don't think we have anyone in Georgia specifically who would be able to arrange that right away, but we could then do that outreach. So I would just say send an email saying what you could help out with um, in Georgia, being very specific. And um, because, you know, like usually the state legislators, what they what you need to do is you need to find one or two or sometimes more sponsors of the screening. And then they also invite people. So the logistics don't cost anything, but taking me and other experts there, for example, or if we need to do more advertising, or if no one can make those contacts, the time to find a, a state rep who would, you know, um, would sponsor this. Um, that'd be great to to co-sponsor. We're also looking for sponsors for the screening in the U.S. Senate, um, and and so like I just don't want to say the names of the states just because nothing has been confirmed. So I don't want to jinx it. Yeah, um, don't, so, don't jinx so today, it. What if, none of them are Georgia. I will say that. Yeah, no. Um, I'll I'll fight the fight that I can fight, which is locally, and, and I'm local to Georgia, which is like in my home for the last uh, 11, 12 years now. Um, so I suppose I could start some of the legwork by just working on the telephone and start calling some of the local, uh, some of the local state senators and state uh, representatives and see if I can't get one or have, two. Have, have you have you taken the ambassador training, Dave? No, I have not. Sign up to be an ambassador because that's how it teaches you how to set up screenings. But also, you know, if people just say, you know, I want to sponsor it and, and give money to set up a screen, but I don't want to do the legwork. Just let us know, and then if then we can find a way to make it happen. Because um, also, you know, if the business wants to sponsor, I'm not going to say I'm going to make you call up your state senator. Uh, so 
So whatever you, you're willing to do, if, as long as you're clear, um, if you want to do a little vault, that's great. Um, but it's good to know because, and we're keeping these separate because when people donate to a racing family, those funds are used um, in a general pool to complete the film and like our impact campaign with our youth groups, um, stuff like that. We're not using those funds to host screenings because then it just becomes an unfair kind of competition of who do we, where do we go with the, with the funds. So then if people want to host a particular screening, we'll ask for that local group to fundraise or find sponsors for that particular screening as a way to keep it fair. Otherwise, it's like, why am I choosing to take the film to New York and not to Kentucky? Um, so, so that's kind of how we're doing it as, as, a, as a way to be fair. If we can find some magical donor out there who would like donate a ton of money to do screens all over U.S. and Canada, like that'd be awesome too. Well, I can't. I I, I don't have that kind of money for. Uh, no, no, no. I know, but but Georgia would be great. Just let us know specifically, and I encourage everybody to take the ambassador training. There's people who take it, but then actually don't really do much as far as setting up screens. But they find it very helpful to learn how to talk more effectively about this issue, or they help volunteer in other ways, like doing administrative work, writing press releases. Because some people aren't ready to go out in public and talk about this, even though we're very clear, you don't have to tell your story, we don't want you to tell your story. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just a helpful training, it's only a few hours. Well, so I'm not just an associate producer on A Racing Family, I'm also an associate producer on Casualties of War, uh, Women in the Regime, which, quite frankly, it's, it, it, it's another tale of of how men have and children have uh, suffered in the system, although it's not as it's not as well balanced as a racing family it is based on what I've seen so far, the little snippets I've seen of a racing family. Um, but if I'm willing to if I'm willing to find something that's on one level of production, and I'm certainly willing to fund something that's on much uh, a higher level of production, like a racing family. So. Uh, well, let's keep on talking just because I don't want to take up too much of, of, of their time on their on their podcast if I know us. But I have your contact and let's keep let's keep on talking because that would be great if you could sponsor a screening in Georgia um, and get it wrong. Uh, uh, feel free to trim out my stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It's all good stuff because it, it the thing is is it's important that everybody has an opportunity to be involved in in this whole work, this whole movement of trying to heal families and, and uh, bring harmony to the families that are hurting, especially the children. So. Okay, good deal. All right, thank you so much. And we will uh, we'll see you again next week. All right, thank you.